Touchdown number four on the night for Davis. Do you like pain? Pain don't hurt. Do you enjoy movies with sad or horrible endings? And Anderson hasn't missed in two years. Is your favorite episode of Game of Thrones the Red Wedding? Looking to the end zone for the win! He caught it! Well, today's episode of That's Good Sports is for you. I'm football word vomiter Brandon Perna, and today I want to relive some of the most heartbreaking playoff losses in NFL history. As a Broncos fan, my team is going on eight straight seasons without a playoff appearance, and I just want to feel something in January, even if it is pain. While every playoff loss stings, some sting like bees. Bees who also infected you with AIDS. I'm talking 80 for me, an all-time heartbreaker, personally, was the conclusion of the 1996 Denver Broncos season. They were 13-3, first place in the AFC. This was the first season I really remember being all in on my team as a Broncos fan. It was the first impressive season the Broncos had had in five years, clinching a first round bye. Denver was matched up with the Jacksonville Jaguars, who under head coach Tom Coughlin were in their second season as an expansion team. They had a respectable year but we're nine and seven and twelve and a half point underdogs heading into the game which made their victory all that much more painful as a Broncos fan that game was literally the first time I cried after a football game the first tears I ever shed were not of joy but of pain and agony in the throes of defeat. Almost every football fan has had an experience like that. It's a rite of passage for sports fans. Before you can know true joy, you must know what it feels like to have your heart ripped out of your chest on the biggest stage. Now Denver won the Super Bowl the following season, which does not make this specific loss an all-time heartbreaker. I am gonna reveal those heartbreakers to you in this episode of That's Good Sports. Because there are so many tragic losses, uh, I'm not going to include Super Bowls in this episode. If this one does numbers, uh, Will and Johnny and I will hit you with the Super Bowl heartbreaker episode. But let's start with one of the more recent postseason tragedies. 13 seconds. The Buffalo Bills and Kansas City Chiefs. The Bills, more than any team in NFL history, have found creative ways to give their fans cardiac arrest in the postseason. <laughs> Losing in Arrowhead to Patty Mahomes and the Chiefs in overtime was so traumatic, the NFL changed the playoff overtime rules. Remember, Josh Allen and the Bills offense completed an insane comeback drive to take the lead with 13 seconds left in the game. A masterclass in football jizzery. All they had to do was keep Kansas City out of field goal range with 13 seconds left on the clock. They did not do that, and then lost the coin toss, and then the game because they allowed the Chiefs to score a touchdown, which was the only thing that guaranteed their offense, their dynamic Josh Allen offense, wouldn't get a chance to answer, leading to a rule change that we've yet to see play out in the postseason. And because I don't like piling on, for now, I will spare the Dallas Cowboys, who had the 14-second playoff game, where Dak ran the QB draw and then ran out of time against the 49ers, and of course, maybe the most heartbreaking Cowboys playoff loss ever, the Tony Romo bobbled snap against the Seahawks in the 2006 wild card, and Zeke playing center. And I'm not sparing the Cowboys out of kindness. I'm sparing them because we might be working on a Cowboys video for the offseason. Instead, let's turn to 2017 and 2018 with the Minneapolis miracle and the Saints no PI call against the Rams. One thing I like to factor into football tragedy with losses is destiny. If the winning team goes on to win the Super Bowl, for me it eases the pain a bit because I can justify it by saying, ah, well shit, it was destiny. The Saints had destiny on their side following the 2009 season. And as they defeated the Colts in the Super Bowl, we all felt like it was destiny for the city of New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina destroyed the city and made life hell for people of New Orleans. 
You know what they say though, no good deed goes unpunished and Drew Brees and the Saints were punished in horrifying fashion in back-to-back -back postseasons. The Saints lost to the Vikings and Rams and neither one of those teams went on to win the Super Bowl. So they were not casualties of destiny, they just fucking blew it. The Vikings took a two point lead with exactly 129 uh, left on the clock at the end of the 2017 divisional playoff game. Drew Brees drove down the field converting a fourth and 10 to Willie Sneed. And in retrospect, Alvin Kamara not being able to pick up this third and one is what cost the Saints everything. New Orleans kicks a field goal, takes a one point lead with 25 seconds left in the game. Case Keenum, yes, Case Keenum and the Vikings go to work and they're in a terrible position at their own 39 yard line with no timeouts left. The Saints just need to tackle the Vikings in bounds and the game is over. Instead, Stephon Diggs catches the walk off touchdown after Marcus Williams displays one of the worst form tackles in football history. I've never been so excited by a play where I really didn't care who won the game in my entire life. It was that electric and knowing the Saints were on the wrong end of it when they were fighting for their Super Bowl life one year later and didn't get the most obvious pass interference call in postseason history against the Rams, I pair these two stupid playoff losses together to make for one giant, elongated, heartbreaking calamity. 2001, the Raiders and the Tuck Rule game. The Oakland Raiders could have held off the beginning of the Patriots dynasty for one more season had Tom Brady's fumble not been reversed due to the now infamous tuck rule. Personally, I think of the tuck rule as the game where Justin Tuck sacked Tom Brady twice in Super Bowl 42, helping the Giants to victory. That's how I remember it. The real tragedy in this game though was the Raiders inability to tackle, wait for it, wait for it, the elusive Tom Brady in the fucking snow. He had a rushing touchdown in this game and converted a key first down with his legs late. You know what they say, slow white guys are the hardest to see in the snow. Less than two minutes in this game, Charles Woodson comes off the corner blitz, strip sacks Tom Brady and the Raiders recover, game over except due to that weird little tuck rule that no longer exists, the refs rule this as an incomplete pass as Tom's arm was moving forward, which is true, but he was clearly trying to tuck the throw, and this is clearly a fumble even by his own admission. But once you get here and you bring it back and this little chicken wing is right here, yeah. and I hit that ball, yeah. that's a fumble. I agree. 100%. I agree with what you're saying. I don't. I don't think that's exactly what happened. But that's not how it was ruled. This was probably the most significant officiating call in NFL history. Good call, Walt, good call. And what had to kill Raiders fans is that even after that bizarre ruling, they watched in horror as Adam Vinatieri kicked arguably the most difficult, most clutch field goal in a postseason game, a 45 yarder in near whiteout conditions to send the game into overtime, where he then easily blast the game winner. That loss though ended John Gruden's time in Oakland. He was traded to the Buccaneers in the offseason, where he coached them to a Super Bowl to destroy his former Raiders, and they have never been the same since. Al Davis gave us the blueprint of what not to do when your coach's value is as high as it will ever be. So we're going to the 2006 AFC Divisional Round, Chargers versus Patriots. And guess what? The Chargers made the same dumb mistake as the Raiders. They not only lost to Tom Brady's Patriots by a field goal, they then got rid of their head coach, Marty Schottenheimer, after the loss. Marty had just led the Chargers to a 14-2 record, the one seed in the AFC, and this game was so bad it cost him his job. It's always tough if your team is the, the one seed and they get bounced in the divisional round. How the Chargers blew this one is probably why the city of San Diego made no effort to keep their team. It's fourth and five with 625 left in the game and the Chargers' Marlon McCree picks Tom Brady. He picks Brady in the fourth quarter, a rare gaffe by Tom who has never been bailed out several times in the postseason ever. Fumble, or in this case, tough <laughs> rule. Patriots receiver Troy Brown strips the ball and receiver uh, Rasheed Caldwell recovers it. 
Chargers players Lorenzo Neal and Nick Hardwick have claimed that when McCree intercepted the ball, everyone on the Chargers sideline was yelling to get down, get down, get down, McCree. I'm assuming Schwarzenegger was doing that too. Get down, Chargers, get down. The Pats scored 11 straight points, including shutting down a Chargers team that had 11 Pro Bowlers that season, six All Pros, and Ladanian Tomlinson, who had one of the greatest running back seasons of all time. Then we go to 1992, the wild card game between the Oilers and Bills. Believe it or not, the Bills were actually on the right side of an insane postseason game. They were the ones doing the tragedy. They were the Shakespeare's writing the script. I'm talking about the biggest comeback in playoff history. Now until the Vikings wiped a 33-0 deficit off the board in 2022 against the Colts, the Bills 32 point comeback against the Oilers was the biggest comeback in NFL history, not just postseason. And it was one of the first football events I ever wrote about at age eight in elementary school. The game is simply called the comeback. The heartbreak is really twofold here though. One, you have the Oilers blowing a 32 point lead at halftime with Warren Moon at quarterback. A guy I would have loved to see get one Super Bowl. Instead, the Oilers never made it to the big game, ever. Two, even though the Bills won, it led to their worst ass kicking in the Super Bowl, <laughs> which was also their third straight loss. The Bills accomplished this feat with backup quarterback Frank Reich taking over for the injured Jim Kelly. It would have been uh, one thing to lose to Jim Kelly and the Bills K-Gun offense, but to allow the man who David Tepper would eventually fire is truly heartbreaking. 2009, the NFC Championship game. The 09 Vikings could have prevented Drew Brees and the Saints from winning their only Super Bowl had Brett Favre not made the dumbest throw of his career, which is saying something for Favre. Why do you even ponder passing? I mean, you can take a knee and try a 56-yard field goal. This is not Detroit, man. This is the Super Bowl. But knowing Favre was probably thinking about I don't know, how to use welfare money to pay for a volleyball stadium allegedly in this moment instead of reading the defense makes me think this is the most justified loss in playoff history. No offense, Vikings fans. 1999, the Bills wildcard game versus the Titans in the Music City Miracle. Anytime the word miracle is attached to the name of a game, you know it's gonna be bad for the loser. The 11 and five Bills went to Tennessee to play the 13 and three Titans. The Bills under Wade Phillips had one of the best defenses in the league and the Titans had quarterback Steve McNair who had ruptured a disc in his back and missed just one month of football that season. Buffalo goes on to make a late game field goal. They take a one point lead with just 16 seconds left in the game. The Bills were riddled with injuries, which meant they had to throw out any willing body for their coverage unit. Lorenzo Neal of the Titans gets the ball, dishes it over to Steve Wycheck. Wycheck then throws it to vacuum inventor Kevin Dyson. The new Dyson vacuum has a ball, no loss of suction. Who takes it to the house for the walk-off win. In terms of Bill's heartbreak, I'm not sure this is even top five for them. <laughs> They're like a team serving a life sentence, and this was the equivalent of finding out they just got 10 years added. But what does hurt, like the tuck rule and the Saints no call on the pass interference play, is that this is probably a forward pass by Wycheck, which is illegal. Dyson being well ahead of the line makes it look worse than it really is because I think it's close, but I think 99 out of 100 times, this is probably rule the penalty and called back. Then we've got Seahawks Packers 2014. This game was so heartbreaking for the Packers and their fans, it caused one Tom Grossi to start a YouTube channel. They gotta get an Kick. Do you know the likelihood of them actually getting it? Son of a bitch, they got an onside kick. So much of the discussion surrounding Aaron Rodgers' Hall of Fame career is that in spite of four MVPs and the mind-boggling touchdown to interception splits, he's only won one Super Bowl, the only Super Bowl he's ever appeared in. But it's not like he hasn't been close. After winning it all in 2010, Rodgers and the Packers appeared in four NFC title games and lost them all. The Packers went to their locker rooms at a halftime in this game up 16 to zero in Seattle. Hell. They led by 12 points with just over two minutes left in the fourth quarter. They were on a straight ahead path towards Arizona to play the Patriots, a team they had to 
undefeated earlier in the season, but it all came crashing down. Russell Wilson threw his fourth interception of the game to Morgan Burnett, and instead of returning it for a possible pick six, Julius Peppers told them to fall down, assuming that the game may already be won. But Burnett was just the first domino to fall for the Seahawks to get back into the game and fall they did. A fake field goal where John Ryan tossed a touchdown to wide open Gary Gilliam. Uh, a desperation onside kick that bounced off reserve tight end Brandon Bostick and into the arms of Seahawks receiver Chris Matthews. A 14 yard touchdown run by Marshawn Lynch and a vintage Russell Wilson play on the two point conversion. It it only took the Seahawks 44 seconds to turn a 12-point deficit into a three-point lead. That's heartbreaking. It didn't matter that a hobbled Aaron Rodgers orchestrated one of the best drives of his career to tie it up before overtime. We all know what happened in that extra period. Seattle got the ball first and never let go. Stamping their ticket to the Super Bowl on a rainbow lob from Russell Wilson to Jermaine Curse in the end zone. The Packers have yet to return to the Super Bowl, but this is the game, the quarter really, that still keeps Packers fans up at night. They lost to a quarterback they intercepted four times and sacked five more times against the team they had fallen to in the absurd fail Mary game two years earlier. Scott is too good all the time, man. Every time. The Cowboys and Vikings are now tied for most playoff losses at 31. And maybe the worst for Minnesota came in 1998 against the Falcons. The Vikings were the most powerful, dynamic offense in the league in 98, scoring a then record 556 points and finishing with a record of 15 and one. They had rookie phenom Randy Moss, the resurgent 35-year-old Randall Cunningham at QB and 33-year-old future Hall of Fame receiver Chris Carter. After handling the Cardinals in the divisional round, the path to the Super Bowl looked pretty easy for the Vikings, beat the Falcons at home and play for a chance at their first ever championship. The Vikings were armed with a pretty special weapon, but not on offense, I'm talking 39 year old kicker, Gary Anderson, who had never even been to a Super Bowl. At his advanced age, he was better than ever. The only kicker in the league to finish the season perfect, hitting all 35 of his field goal attempts and all 53 extra points. Yeah, that's a lot of touchdowns and a lot of extra points. In fact, he hadn't missed in two years, 122 consecutive kicks. For all of their dominance, no one on the Vikings could stop Atlanta's top wideouts Tony Carter and Terrence Mathis, who combined for over 200 yards and two touchdowns. Late in the fourth quarter, the Vikings had a chance to put the game out of reach. If Gary Anderson could do what he had done all year and connect on a 38 yard field goal, one yard shorter than his age. And he saved his first miss of the season for the most crucial moment and maybe the most cruel announcer jinx in sports history. And Anderson hasn't missed in two years. And Anderson hasn't missed in two years. And Anderson hasn't missed in two years. And it's not good. Now the Vikings could have made a stop and won this game, but they looked shell-shocked and let Chris Chandler, Chandler, send the game to overtime with a touchdown pass to Terrence Mathis. Uh, the Vikings offense, their record-setting offense, had two more chances in overtime to win it. All they needed to do was get into field goal range, but both possessions ended in a punt, and the other Anderson, Morton, won it on coincidentally a 38 yard field goal. The Vikings haven't been that close to a Super Bowl since that day. Cunningham never went to a Super Bowl, Carter never went, and Moss never won. All right, let's talk about my Broncos who handed the Pittsburgh Steelers their most heartbreaking playoff loss. The 11 and five Steelers had to go to Denver to play the eight and eight Tim Tebow led Denver Broncos who had lost three in a row to sneak into the playoffs. The Steelers have had so much postseason success it's hard to feel bad for them and their terrible towels, but it's hilarious to me that Tim Tebow completed just 10 passes against that defense and managed over 300 passing yards and had more passing touchdowns than Big Ben in this game. This one is a true heartbreaker because it went into overtime and it was the first ever overtime playoff game after the overtime rules had been changed from sudden death to each team could have a possession as long as the team that got the ball first didn't score a touchdown. But on the first play, 
In overtime, Tim Tebow hits Demarius Thomas, who stiff-armed Ike Taylor and never looked back. Not only was that Tebow's only playoff win, he only started one more game in his career after that. And finally, a two-for-one special, the drive and the fumble, delivered by my Broncos to the Browns in the 80s. What was more heartbreaking, the drive or the fumble? Well, they were both AFC Championship losses to the same team, both so devastating to the Browns that it only takes two words to conjure up those nightmarish endings for Cleveland. But I think the drive was definitely worse than the fumble. And here's why. First of all, uh, the drive happened in Cleveland, in the dog pound. They all laid witness to the game that made John Elway, John Elway. Cleveland and its fans still had their innocence. They were closer to the team that dominated the NFL with Jim Brown than the team that would eventually move and stumble through the first couple decades of the 21st century. That drive totally shattered their worldview. They were ahead in the final minutes and there were 98 and a half yards in between the Broncos and merely tying the game. They just needed one stop. And he completes a pass. Then he completes another pass. Hell, all they had to do was stop Denver from converting on third and 18, and they would have gone to Pasadena. The ball clipped off of Steve Watson, and Elway still picked it up and fired a strike to convert. Elway got his team into the end zone, and Denver won the game with a short kick in overtime. A total stunner. The momentum had swung totally in Cleveland's favor. This was not an offensive shootout. Every yard was hard earned, and Elway managed to get 90 of them when it mattered the most. The fumble one year later was a shootout. At least it was when Cleveland came back from 28 to 10 and tied the game up at 31 in the fourth quarter. Denver eventually wrestled the lead back and we know how Cleveland's attempt to answer back went. They fumbled on the goal line. You can say that the fumble by Ernest Biner was an all-time blunder, but it was just as equally incredible uh, play by the Broncos safety Jeremiah Castile to rip the ball away before Biner crossed the goal line, causing more pain in Cleveland. And Cleveland was never supposed to win that game. They were supposed to win the year before until they didn't. And that game, more than the fumble, changed what it meant to be a Browns fan. Really, what it meant to be a Cleveland sports fan. It's a generational trauma that parents pass on to their children and still exists and forever will until the Browns finally win a Super Bowl. Thanks for watching That's Good Sports. Most heartbreaking, tragic, colossally horrible playoff losses. Please subscribe here on YouTube. And if you like this video, thumbs it up and uh, we will get a Super Bowl one in as well.